When a woman is expecting a child, there is joy, there's excitement, and there's hope for the future, planning for the baby, and thinking of the best life possible. But in this life, sometimes mothers will lose their children after birth. How do they find life again after that loss? We live out loud with Vivian Nashipai Gaiko next. Hello and welcome to Sheila Lives Out Loud. My name is Sheila Moniga. I'm glad you found this channel. Please click subscribe and hit notifications so you never miss an episode when we upload. We are living out loud at the Westwood Hotel, all set to have a conversation on life after loss with Vivian Geico. Welcome to the show, Vivian. Thank you. Thank How you, Sheila. How are you? I am very well, thanks. Thank you for having me in your <laughs> show. <laughs> you look lovely. We've been through lots to make this happen today. Yeah. But thank you for bearing with us and for being patient with us. In a nutshell, how would you describe yourself? Vivian is just a lady who is very ambitious and uh, loves helping people. <laughs> I will be having my 27th birthday in a few days. Yay, yeah, we are coming for days. cake. Yeah. Yes, we are with you. <laughs> yeah, so I studied um, medical lab science and technology. Right. And I started an organization called Empower Mama Foundation that supports uh, grieving parents. And I'm also a wife. I'm a mom of two. A one child that I carry in my heart and one that I'm raising now. Almost 27. Yes. And so full of life and giving back to the community through your initiative, Empower Mama. Mm -hmm. But Empower Mama was born out of your own personal experience. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine, you know, you've worked hard, you've gone to college, you've got a great job, you found the love of your life and you're expecting your first child. And you were excited about it and mm -hmm. you go the full term and then things change. Let's go back there. What happened? Back in 2013, I was pregnant with our first child. And of course, it was mixed feelings because I was still in school. I was in third year. So um, I was happy. I was, uh, it's too soon. I'm not yet done with school. So I had, I kind of had mixed feelings, but yeah, we are pro-life. So we chose to keep the baby. The pregnancy was smooth. I never had any issues. All the tests were okay. Everything was normal. And so D-Day came in 2014 on the 2nd of April and my daughter was born. Uh, sad, uh, I went through 12 hours of labor. Whoa. Yeah, it was really, yeah, I know, something else. And I had to go in for a C-section mm -hmm. uh, because of um, CPD, for those who would uh, know, it's cephalopelvic dispropriation. Which means? Which means my space, my pelvic space is too small. It couldn't uh, accommodate the head of the baby. Right. And this nurse tells me after 12 hours of labor, of labor. So I was really angry with, <laughs> with that nurse. Yeah, but my baby was born uh, on the 2nd at 12 noon, and she was adorable. Yeah, that's the best thing I've ever seen. I, I actually shed a tear, and the doctor was like, why are you crying? I'm like, I'm happy. I've never seen Finally. this beautiful little thing. We stayed in the hospital four days, went back home, and two weeks later, I was now to go back for a, a wound checkup yeah. for my for my wound check uh, the CS wound, and uh, the nurse just grabbed the baby and said, "This baby is not looking okay." Mm -hmm. So he had to be admitted. It was actually exactly two weeks after birth, so they never checked my my wound that time, and they said the baby was uh, not looking well. I. I didn't know, That's something that I really blamed my, myself for a long time. How could I not tell a baby is not feeling well or is not, you know. Mm -hmm. But she, she never fe used to feed well and I thought it was this myth that people say that right. girls, girls don't feed a lot. You yeah, know, there are all sorts of things that people tell each other and mm -hmm. we've grown up hearing about babies yeah. and caring for babies. Mm -hmm. So that I thought it was that because she would feed uh, just kidogo and then sleep. She had difficulties breathing, something uh, I never thought was that serious because I thought she was just, 
you know trying maybe to normal. raise her head right. apparently you right. know that was uh, she had some uh, problems breathing so she, she had to raise her head oh, and right. do this mm. uh, yeah so we actually thought ah this baby is too young to even raise the head but you, you know you, we, you just we didn't, didn't know. know yeah you were mm. a first I was a first time mom so everything was new to me we went to the hospital they uh, they put her on oxygen they they even put her on drip and that was another thing it traumatized me because you know they are such so a tiny beings. and they're looking for the veins and yes. such a tiny little being yes do you know that moment my milk dried up you know the way they say stress causes you know uh, the breast milk supply to reduce right. mine dried up completely Com- i've never <laughs> seen such a thing and i was even being told to express some milk for the baby because now i can't feed her mm. she's on oxygen she has to be fed by tubes yeah. and i couldn't even express an email it was sad and they had to put her on formula and she will regurgitate it and it was too hard for her it was yeah. too foreign she was not used to that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so we stayed in that hospital uh, but the next day a doctor friend of ours came and said uh, this this baby is not looking okay we have to get a transfer right now so we went to kenyatta that was my first time boarding an ambulance so for me i hear those sirens and i feel like oh. it takes you back to a very mm-hmm. tough time yes yes so uh, we took her to Kenya and we were admitted and the doctor now started asking the history and we were giving the history and she wrote there you know query sepsis and i was like ah oh, i read this thing in school and what was registering in my head that time was fatal because neonatal sepsis is really fatal if especially if not diagnosed early um, yeah but if it is diagnosed early some interventions can be made and mm-hmm. yeah they can curb their the illness so for me i think i just went blank they took up the, some blood for testing and we were to wait because you know kenyatta is chrome <laughs> there's yeah. no bed no. we had to actually wait and we got our bed around 7 pm after waiting the whole entire day yeah yeah from 11 am mm-hmm. yeah so we got her a bed around 7 uh, 7 pm and she was put on an drip she was getting panic attack they were trying to resuscitate I, i all this was happening too fast for me and i i can't even explain my feelings at that moment i was just too numb mm-hmm. <laughs> to believe this was happening and it was actually happening to me yeah yeah so mm, At 8 p.m. she took her last breath. They actually tried their best. The, the doctors there did the best they could, but of course at that moment I was like you can do more. You can yeah. Like don't stop, just keep trying. Yes. So uh, they gave her actually they gave her a dose of epinephrine, the one that stimulates the heart. Yeah. And these are those you can't pity her for the uh, for the weight of the baby mm-hmm. and Yeah, that was the last they tried resuscitating they even tried to remove me from there but i was like ah you're not leaving her yeah so even the doctor who broke to us the news was she was heartbroken than us because you know and i could see it in her eyes and i was wondering i know how do this you know how do they even work mm-hmm. telling people mm-hmm. your baby is no more yeah so remember when i had gone for the wound check up we never went home so mm. this is the second day the second this was day. the 18th of april yeah so we went we just had to go home and that was when reality reality came in yeah i i went home with no baby i left home with a baby and suddenly you're coming and back suddenly home. i'm coming back with a baby what was What was that like for you? Did you even sleep at all? No, I did not. I actually when you know removed all the clothes I had mm. from the hospital and threw them outside because I didn't want to see them because I I had worn them while carrying my baby now um you know yeah without the baby. Mm, the feeling is just I can't even describe it. It's painful. It's in some I it's in some amount of I can't even describe it. It's just a pain that cuts deep deep. 
So that's it. That's how the first phase was. Right. I, mm -hmm. I am very sorry for your loss. Thank you. And you know, those are just words. Mm -hmm. But there, I, I truly am. Thank you. I, I, I truly am. And I'm just listening to you and then trying to put myself in that position where you have to pick up and um, you still have to keep moving mm -hmm. forward. How did you, how, how did you, where did you even begin? Was it friends, was it family, was it prayer? Where did you begin from there? Mm, I had very supportive family. I, my mom-in-law, my mom, my, my sisters-in-law, my siblings, they, are really, they were really supportive at the time. And I also have a mentor, this lady, she's called Vicky. I know she's watching. <laughs> um, she really, thank you. She really supported me. She had been through a loss as well before, and that was 25 years back. Yeah. And she remembered, and she could relate, and I could feel that support from her. So for me, um, generally, the way things are in our society, uh, people will visit you just, you know, immediately after the loss and maybe a few days, a month, mm -hmm. then they go. And now reality kicks in, you're alone. There's no one else with you. So for me, I think I, I, I went into depression. You know, the normal process of grief, it's, it's, it's really painful. You're angry, there's a whole lot of emotions. The guilt, the blame, you feel helpless, you feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. So all these things are happening to, you know, to one, one person, person yes. at the same time. At the same time, there's a lot of confusion. Um, so when you don't have support, it can be hard. It can be really hard. But there were people there. Yeah, there were people there. In as much as everyone can come and grieve with you, but they also have to go back to their yes. lives and their yes. pressures and their concerns. Mm -hmm. But bit by bit, things started moving. So we, the burial mm -hmm. was done uh, the next day. Uh, this is something that we were robbed of a uh, decision to make. Really? You know, by their family and friends. Um, you know, the way people say, um, mm -hmm. I actually never mourned my baby and that affected my grieving process later in life. Mm -hmm. Later that year, actually. And we were literally robbed of that decision. Despite the good intentions of family and friends, Vivian and her husband had no say in the burial of her newborn. In part two, she shares on how the ensuing grief and helplessness drove her to attempt to end her life twice.